Okay, uh, thanks for coming to the last session of uh, the day and also of the workshop. Uh, and Yael will tell us about uh, non-interactive uh, delegation. So, thank you. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, thanks for organizing this. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, great, great to be here. Very exciting time, I feel, for quantum, crypto, the marriage of quantum and crypto. So what you'll see in the, what I'm going to talk about today is actually it's a, it's a crypto result uh, that uses, it's about verifying computation, verifying deterministic computation. But we're going to use uh, kind of, uh, we're inspired in using ideas from quantum to get here. So, uh, so yeah, it's based on a bunch of actually a uh, series of work, starting with uh, Ran Raz and Ron Rothblum, and then with Tzvika Brakelsky and Justin Holmgren, and then a very recent result. Uh, the names of doctors are here. Uh, but what we're, gonna, what we're gonna show today is it's very similar to, a, to, uh, to the talks we, we've seen before about verifi verifiable computation, but we're focused here in the non-interactive setting. So let me explain uh, what, what we mean. But before I go ahead, I just want to say a big thank you to Justin because he gave me some of his slides. So the beautiful slides here are thanks to him. The ugly ones are my own. Um, okay, so let's start. So what is the, what is the verifiable computation in the non-interactive setting? So this is the problem we're trying to solve. There's a very weak device. Not, not only classical, he's really weak, okay? He can't run his time. He can run only in very short amount of time. There is a cloud here that's powerful. That's your prover, okay? So the powerful prover, and this prover is gonna prove correctness of computations to this weak, weak device. And what, the way we're thinking about it, we want, we want the proofs to be just certificates. We want them to be non-interactive. And the way we get it is as follows. The weak device, once and for all, sends some public parameters, some string, some short string to the cloud. And now, for any computation, so there's a Turing machine M, that uh, you want to prove that a Turing machine M and output and input X outputs one after time T, okay? So you want to prove that. The cloud can just give like a certificate, like remember the mathematical proofs we're used to that you know you just write on a piece of paper? That's the kind of proof he's gonna give to the weak verifier, to the smartwatch here. Okay, just gonna give a short proof that the Turing machine M and input X outputs one within T time steps. Okay? And you can do that over and over again. So uh, for another computation, another computation, who chooses this computation? Anybody can choose it. The smartwatch can say, please, you know, prove the compute and prove. It can the cloud choose, someone else can choose. But the point is that this weak device can get proofs for any computation and you can verify them very efficiently. Okay, that's what we want to do, and let me define it a bit more formally. By the way, well, I see you guys, I know you're a very interactive audience, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I, I'm not sure, I'm gonna try to pace, I don't quite know, you know what you guys know and don't know, so please, please stop me you know, with questions. Okay, so what is the goal, what's the object? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, do you also care about the result of the computation? Yes, yeah. yeah, so I'm thinking the result is just being a bit, but that's just for simplicity. You can think about it as being a, a string. Uh, but yeah, so he's gonna give, this is my result, let's say one or zero or a long string, and a proof that uh, indeed this is the result. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you can think of M as being deterministic. Turing machine can be non-deterministic. Actually, it can also be quantum. And we're gonna get to that in the, uh, at the end of the talk. Our results are not in the quantum setting, but we're gonna get to that setting at the end of the talk. Okay, so what is the goal? What do we want? The first thing that makes this non-trivial is we want efficiency. Okay, efficiency and succinctness. So what do I mean? The communication complexity should be very short. The length of the proof should be very short. How short depends on T only polylogarithmically. Okay? Uh, uh, the runtime of the ver the verifier should be very efficient. Okay, otherwise he'll do the computation on its own. How efficient? Well, he needs to read kind of the input, which I'm thinking of it as just like the length of x, because think of x as being greater than log t and greater than the description of this uniform Turing machine here. But essentially, he needs to read, to read the input that he must do. And then we're, we're allowing like polylog overhead. Okay, but essentially, he cannot do the computation, of course. And the prover should also be efficient. So the prover needs to do the computation, 
okay? If he has a witness, okay, he, uh, he needs to do the computation, but he should not, he's not like a, a Merlin, uh, like in an unstuck. Okay, it's more, uh, he, uh, it's like a normal stock where we want him to be as efficient as running the computation plus some polynomial, times some polynomial overhead. Yes? Why doesn't the communication include the length of x? Why doesn't it include? So actually the communication can include the length of x. It will still be very interesting. The reason I'm just writing this is because this is what we achieve. We can get better, so I'm. It's in, yeah, it depends only polygorithmically on t. The length of the proof and the parameters will not, depend on the length of x. x to the prover. Good, so you're saying who generates this, right? So, so it, can, it depends on the application. You can think of application, anybody can, can choose it. You can think of an application where there's a weak verifier. So I, or a weak device, me, I'm weak, and I want you, strong Umesh, to prove things to me or to compute things for me. So I come and tell you, oh, so me as the weak device, I tell you what computations to do, and you do it. You can think of settings that actually the cloud, you know, chooses the computation and tells the world, or tells. The so so these, these parameters that are being sent, yeah. can they be sent once and for all and then use many, multiple times? Yes, yeah. they, we'll get back, there is a point there, but yeah, um, uh, th there's a delicate, the answer is not as simple, but the, 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 the answer is essentially yes. Uh, we're thinking of it as sending ahead of time once and for all, uh, and then you can reuse it again and again and again. Uh, there's a star there, which I'll say a little later what the star is. Sorry, what's given a witness? I didn't understand. That. Yeah, so I want the prover to be efficient. But if it's a non-deterministic computation, of course you can, I mean, if it's an NP computation, you can be efficient. But you can be efficient given the witness. So I want him to be as efficient as the person if, if there's a witness and, yeah, okay. What I wanna emphasize here, which is different from what we've seen today, is that this is even interesting for polynomial time computations. So w this is also what's called doubly efficient proof systems, where even for P, so it, let's say all I want is to delegate polynomial time computations. Still this, this verifier is not P, he is, he runs in very, you know, he doesn't want to do the computation. That's too much for him. He only wants to run in this time. So actually for this talk, I think it'll be, it's a, you should think in your head when you listen to this talk as delegating P computations or NP. Okay, but the scaled down version, not X per, or next even though you can, but uh, it's, it'll be kind of, this is the regime that kind of we're interested in, even though it expands the higher uh, complexity classes. So you want us to think, of, think about t as n to the 10? Yeah, you should think of t as n to the 10, n to the 100. Well, yeah, exactly. Where n is the input length. Yes? The communication complexity only counts from the prover to the verifier? Both. Actually, both of them are going to be polylog. And actually, I want to say I'm, I'm hiding something. This is a remark more to the expert, experts in the audience, but usually there's also a security parameter that comes into the picture, and I'm kind of hiding it. You can think of log t polylog T as being the security parameter. I'm kind of omitting it from the slide for simplicity. Yes? The first message contains X, right? So how can it be polylog T? Yeah, so, okay. This, I'm not thinking of this as a message. The message is just the proof of the computation. Yeah, so, yeah, the, the parameters are short and the proof length is short. Even, even if, like, X is long. Wonderful. The verifier sending some additional random bits to the prover or not? No, just the parameter that are, you can, that are sent in the beginning of time. Okay. So, okay, so what do we want? So we said succinctness, but now we of course want the standard, we want completeness and soundness. What do, what do we mean by completeness? Of course, if, if you did a computation correctly, you should prove that the verifier will accept you. Okay, just standard completeness. Uh, so for any computation, if you did it correctly, you generate the proof correctly, the verifier will accept you. That's standard completeness. Soundness is a bit more tricky. So first we want adaptive soundness. We want to say any cheating prover, he sees the parameters. Now he can choose maliciously any, any computation of his choice. If the computation, let's say, is not one and he proves that it's one, then he'll be rejected. With very, so he'll be accepted only with negligible tiny probability. <coughs> so uh, he cannot cheat. However, note we only focus 
and computationally bounded cheating provers. This is similar to our Millet's talk, which she also assumed that the P star cannot break LWE. Our P star also cannot break LWE. That's what we assume. Our P star cannot break LWE. But I want to point out that in this setting, it's kind of inherent. Okay, we believe that without this assumption, if you allow all powerful cheating provers, then you cannot do it. There's no way you can do it because of the IP equals P space. Okay, if you're in an, even in the interactive setting, in all powerful, you can only, if the communication is small, you can only uh, get bounded depth, uh, bounded space computations. So you, there's no way you can do all of P or, or NP if you don't put this restriction. So this restriction is necessary in our setting, as opposed to the quantum setting where there, uh, for, uh, we don't see any barrier uh, b besides not, not knowing how to do it. That's exactly the computational assumption that... Uh, that uh... LW, it's actually the same, the same uh, computation. The assumption, I mean, we construct these things under the LW assumption, learning with error. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, but you said your result holds for even T being exponential? Good. That's what, good. Very good. So, right. So the question was, but I, I, am, I said that T can be large. So how can I restrict the prover, the cheating prover, right? That's what you're saying. That's exactly why, why I think it's useful for this talk to think actually of computations in P or NP. But if you want to think of larger computation, that's fine. But, and so you can say, okay, I'm thinking of computations of size T. T can be, I don't know, N to the, even 2 to the N. And now I'm going to take, I'm going to assume that the cheating prover also runs in time at most 2 to the n, and I'm going to take an encryption scheme that cannot be broken in time 2 to the n, which means the security parameter is much, much bigger. You can, you can kind of play this game of amplifying the security parameter to deal with larger computations. Uh, it's called complexity leveraging in our world. Uh, you can do that, but I think then that's why I feel like thinking of it actually in the down-to-earth setting of PNNP is more natural because it's an it's a computationally sound uh, proof system. Great, that's, you guys have great questions. Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, so just say such a scheme, it, we call it a succinct, <laughs> non-interactive argument. So succinct because the, the proofs are short, non-interactive because the proof itself is non-interactive. An argument we call a proof that's only computationally sound, we call it in cryptography an argument system. Okay, it's not a proof, you know, for sure correct. It's an argument. Okay, so in, we call this thing a snarg. That's kind of the notation that we're, we're, we use. Okay, so uh, before we move on, I want to say there's, and this may go, go back to Umish's question about reusing the parameters. There are two types of snargs that were considered in the literature. There's a lot of work on this, and there's two types of snargs. One type that's publicly verifiable, meaning anyone can verify the proof. You put the proof out there, anybody given the parameters and the proof can say, oh, I believe the statement is true. I read the theorem, I believe the statement is true. The other one is privately verifiable, which means only the person who generated the parameters can verify. So in order to verify, you need some secret state corresponding to these parameters. In our case, it will be like a secret key corresponding to the public key of some encryption scheme. Uh, but without this secret key, you cannot verify the proof. So it's only, it's kind of designated verifier. Only the person who generated the parameters and has the secret state can actually verify the proof. And I want to say that our result is in this setting. It's in the private verifiable setting. Okay, and you'll see in a second why. And let me say that there's a lot of work in the publicly verifiable setting, uh, and, but all the work, in the, we would like our work to be in the public verifiable setting. It seems better, because anybody can verify the proof, you know, you just put it out there, anybody can read it, it's, it'll be better. Uh, to our knowledge today, everything in the publicly verifiable setting requires very strong uh, assumptions, such as what we call knowledge assumption or obfuscation type assumption. They require very strong assumption, and the focus of this talk is to get uh, SNARG under uh, standard assumption, under LWE. Okay, and at the end of the talk, I'll go back to this point and say how uh, maybe we can uh, get to the publicly verifiable setting uh, using our, our techniques. But for now, that's our results are in the private verifiable setting. Though I do want to mention that if you allow interaction, if you don't restrict yourself to the non-interactive setting and allow interaction, then already from the 90s, we know how to do this under standard assumptions. 
So the hard part here is getting this non-interactive uh, solutions. Yes? So what, what if I just publish the secret? Doesn't it, uh, doesn't it become publicly verifiable? Yes. Good. So what you can do, good. So the question about privately verifiable was, well, if uh, no problem, I'll give the secret key, and now it's publicly verifiable. You're right, that would be. But then, first, you cannot reuse. It's not non-interactive anymore, because every time you need to give. So now, but once you give the secret key, it's not sound anymore. If people see the secret key, the secret state, corresponding to the parameters, soundness breaks. So you can give that secret, and now everybody can verify, but then you'll need to generate new parameters for the next proof. OK, so the soundness relies on the fact that the secret state corresponding to these parameters are secret. If this secret state is revealed, soundness doesn't hold anymore. OK, and going back to Umush's question, if you can reuse it, currently in our techniques, a, you can reuse it as long as you don't learn the secret state. If you learn every time if you're accepted or rejected, accepted or rejected, this information can actually reveal information about the secret state, in which case it's broken. So you can reuse as long as you're not rejected too much. If you're rejected too much, you'll need to give new public parameters. So, Ian, help me. Yes. I got confused with Good. the last remark. Uh, what's the difference if you do allow interactions? What's the difference between this and the Muggles paper? Yeah, so the Muggle paper uh, is in the interactive setting. And there we can do it. But the Muggle paper, so this is a specific paper that Dorit is talking about, there it's information theoretic security even. It's not even against, we, it's, it's uh, sound against any cheating prover, but it's not all of P. Beca exactly because I said you can't get all of P. So it's restricted only to bounded depth. Yes. Any more questions? Okay. So now, okay, so let me just state our result, and then we'll go to the fun part where we connect all this to quantum. Okay, so what are our results? So the first thing we construct a SNARK for any deterministic polynomial time computation under uh, standard assumption, LWE. Okay, actually we assume any, any FHE can work, but we have FHE from LWE. Uh, we can even, there's other assumptions, but that's good enough for us. Okay, moreover what we show, even for NP, we can get a snarg, but only for bounded depth, bounded space, for, so for non-deterministic computations of bounded space, we can also get a snarg where the communication complexity, the length of the proof, depends on the space. So we grow, the length of the proof grows with the space. So for space, for non-deterministic computation that require a little bit of space, uh, we do get it. Also based on kind of stand standard assumption, stand the reason we have standards kind of quotes because we need for this result to rely on sub-exponential hardness of LWE. So we need to amp the hardness of the LWE. Okay, so the point is we do have uh, snarks for P, we have snarks for NP with bounded space under kind of uh, standard assumptions. You don't, sorry, the quantum resilience is sort of uh, up there. It's an additional, um, you don't need it, but. Uh, yeah, right. So. Yeah, the reason, I, the reason I said quantum resilience, so uh, we only, in these results, we only delegate uh, classical computations. It's not about quantum at all. It's just delegating classical computations. The assumption is quantum resilient. Who cares? Well, first of all, maybe the cheating prover, you know, we're assuming he's powerful. Maybe he has quantum capability. We don't want him to cheat. So if he has quantum capability, if he breaks LWE, we're screwed. But because it's LWE, we assume he doesn't break it. So that's one reason. Another reason why I'm stressing it here is because at the end of the talk, I want to encourage, I want to uh, put a slide encouraging you to, to uh, get this result for quantum computation, in which case we really want the assumption to be quantum resilient. But yeah, so wonderful. Any, any more questions? Okay, so here comes the fun part. Oh, before, let me just say a few words about this verifiable computation. So I think actually it's a very exciting time for uh, this question. And I, I wanna say it for two, two things. A, why do we care about verifiable computation? And B, why do we care about non-interactive verifiable computation? So we care because you know delegation happens in the world. 
Okay, there are cloud systems that you know do computations for us, and we do want to uh, make sure that these things are correct, are, are being done correctly. They're actually used today. You know, there's like Zcash company and others that actually use these things, and you know, these are very important that they're non-interactive. Yes, that the like in the blockchain contains proof that uh, uh, that uh, uh, trans that things have been done correctly, and so on and so forth. So this is actually used. And I want to say that this is one example where there was a remark before about efficiency. This is actually one example of like a huge success story of theoretical cryptography or theoretical uh, complexity theory, where actually there, you know, there's a lot of these schemes have been implemented and pushed to practice. And so I, I googled, uh, I looked for a few implementations, and this is unbelievable. What I'm going to show you is all based on really theoretical results, and I'm sure there's more. This is just so. Here is a bunch of implementations, all being done and based on these proof systems, and some deployed, some just implemented. But it's a really, you know, uh, important topic that uh, it's, I, I feel like it's a big success story of uh, you know where theoretical results have been actually pushed and and, and used. Okay, so now how do we get that? How do we get these snarks? And this is where uh, quantum will help us. Uh, uh, or not really quantum, but quantum models, I should say, quantum-inspired models. Okay, so what is that blueprint? What is the idea? So the basic idea was already proposed by 99, by Bill Mayer and Wetzel, and here is their idea. It's very simple and elegant. The idea is the following. And you know what? Why don't you take a two-prover, or multi-prover, let's think of two, take a MIP, multi-prover interactive proof, and convert it to a snark, to a single, prover, non-interactive argument. How? Uh, just take the two queries that you would give to each prover and encrypt them. Send it encrypted using a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. And he'll give the answers. He'll do the computation under the hood, you know, using the, fully homo the capability of the fully homomorphic encryption scheme. That's the proposal. Before I go into more details, why they propose it and why it works or doesn't work. Let me first, why, 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 did this why is this suggestion so good? Because it turns out that MIP are much easier to construct, okay, or they're more po easier, they're more powerful. So what do we know about MIP? MIP turns out, so first what is an MIP? MIP, this is important, the, the soundness, it's a two-prover, multi-prover interactive proof, and the soundness really relies on the fact that the, the two provers or two clouds do not interact. Okay, they're not allowed to interact. There's a wall between them. They cannot interact. And now they, they prove the validity of a statement to this weak verifier. What's nice about it? Why is this so, why, this is a wonderful uh, model. And uh, the reason it's so wonderful, well, it's wonderful for many reasons, actually was proposed by Ben Oetal to get uh, uh, zero knowledge, information theoretical zero knowledge. Crypto was kind of the, uh, uh, the inspiration. But uh, uh, forget about, put crypto aside. It's amazing because it's very powerful. You can, you can prove any computation in non-deterministic time t where the communication complexity is only poly log in t. It's exactly what we want. Okay, so time t computations, deterministic or non-deterministic, the, the length of the proofs or the communication is only polylog. The verifier is very efficient. Even the provers here are efficient. It really gives you what you want. The provers here run in time poly t, like the computation. The verifier is very efficient. Communication is very efficient. Exactly what we're looking for. But it requires two non-interactive provers. This we don't want to have. We want one prover. So that was exactly their idea. Their idea, well, you know, you have everything you want except for the two non-interactive provers, convert it to protocol with one prover, and now you have everything. So now the question is this sound? Is this protocol sound? Okay. Questions before I will go into the soundness. Okay, let's see. Let me first convince you that it's sound. Okay, why, why is this sound? Look. The reason for it not to be sound is because now the cheating prover, you know, we can't give him the two queries. In the, if he sees the two queries, he can cheat. But he doesn't see them. The way you should think about fully homomorphic encryption, so this is a fully homomorphic a, a encryption scheme. Okay, so actually before we go to soundness, just know this, we assume it's a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. 
thanks to Tzvika and Vinod, we know how to construct this from LWE. So the assumption is LWE, like I promised, okay? And this is the scheme. Now, why, why, why is this uh, uh, scheme sound? Because how should you think of these encryption schemes? Intuitively, you should think about them as locked boxes, right? So nobody can see, it's opaque. You have query one, the poor cheating prover goes into the, the green box, he can't see anything, but he does the computation that he should to get A1. He doesn't see Q2 when he does that. There's no information about Q2, he just sees Q1, he's in the box. You know, the other box is opaque with a different color. When he goes to Q2, he does the same. So it's exactly what, you know, so it should be, so the point of, well, the reason it's sound, because these queries are hidden. They're hidden like they should be, and yet you can still do the computation, which is the, you know, the, uh, the magic of fully homomorphic encryption. You can't see, but you can compute. This is wonderful. So this was proposed. There was even some proof of security in some paper of this heuristic. It was wonderful. We were all happy until there was a proof that there was, it was noticed. This is actually not sound. Okay, so I don't know if you were convinced by my argument that it is sound, but it turns out it's not sound. And the reason it's not sound is, is delicate. So let's see, what went wrong? Do you want me to go back? <laughs> what went wrong? So I'll tell you what went wrong. What do we know about MIP? The soundness of MIP really relies on the fact that answer one is only a function of query one. Answer two is only a function of query two. This is what you guys call local strategies, okay? What happens in our setting? Well, ideally, like I said, you know, what does the, the cloud do? He took, takes the green box, you know, does the computation, takes the pink box or purple box, does the computation, and that's it. That's what, it seems like that's the only thing he can do. However, in reality, I don't know what, he, I mean, he has the boxes. The boxes are not really opaque boxes. At the end of the day, they're bits. Now, I don't know what he can, he can take the bits, encrypting Q1, add them to the bits, encrypting Q2, uh, God knows what he does. And it turns out, it's not the same thing. Moreover, and now maybe the quantum people are gonna wake up a bit, turns out he can actually do more than local strategies. What he can do is, you know, these spooky strategies. And let me explain to you why, okay? So, okay. What does the encryption scheme actually promises us? So what we did, we hit, we hit the queries using an encryption scheme. But what is it that the encryption scheme really promises us? It's not actually an opaque box, like I said. It's a digital thing. And the only thing it promises us is that, is what we call semantic security. What is the semantic security? What it says essentially is if you look at A1, it doesn't reveal information about Q2 beyond what's already known about Q1. You cannot gain information by looking at A1 and Q1 about, you, by looking at A1, you cannot gain information about Q, about Q2. Sorry, so let me repeat, I think I said it wrongly. Looking at A1, if you open the green box, you do not learn any information about the other query, Q2. That will break semantic security. And similarly, if you open this box, a2, you will not learn any information about the other query beyond what you could already learn from Q2. That's, that's exactly what encryption, the semantic security offers you, which is exactly non-signaling for those of you who are familiar with this concept. I can also answer questions. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, any, any questions? I, I'm gonna go deeper into this, but before I go deeper, any, yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. so yes. Sorry, uh, so first, um, we're looking at non-interactive schemes, so why are we looking at these interactive? It's ultimately gonna be one round, right? Exactly, so yeah, so the, good. So uh, uh, ultimately, the, well, let me just go back here. Ultimately, these queries are gonna be my public parameters. They're gonna be fixed. I, had, I mean, they're gonna be fixed, they're gonna be reused all the time. And then whenever you wanna give, whenever a computation comes along and you wanna to prove to me that m and x equals one after t time steps, then you're, you're gonna think of these as the queries to your MIP and you're gonna give me these answers. 
So this is just the, the proof is just this message. I, but you have a very good point because I am using the fact that, I, and I didn't state it explicitly, that the MIPs that I'm using, our MIP has the property that the queries do not depend on the statement. So the qu these queries, they don't depend on the statement. So in that case, why can't, uh, why can't the prover just commit to the entire proof? Or say, uh, take a hash tree of the proof and use a bit commit uh, commitment scheme and Okay, so, right. So the prover can take the entire proof commit, but then he needs to open it. Uh, how, when you, okay, you, you took the entire long proof, you committed to it, good. But now what? I, I'm not, I just saw commitment as a verifier. Where, so actually, you, your intuition is very, very good because the Killian protocol that I mentioned, the interactive one, is exactly of this form. What he does in the Killian protocol, he takes a PCP, a uh, probabilistic checkable proof, and he tree commits to it. And then in the next round, he sends queries. And then the ver so it's a format kind of you send a hash, you get a commitment, you ask reveal, and you reveal. So making, making this uh, non interactive is more difficult than. Exactly. That's the entire thing is how you make this protocol non interactive. Yes. Great, great, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for asking. OK. OK. So as I said, I said the encryption, what it promises you is that you, it doesn't promise locality. It only promises that the cheating prover must behave in a non-signaling way. That's all it is. Actually, it's worse. It's almost non-signaling, but it's even worse. And the reason it's even worse, because it's not true that a, I said A1 doesn't reveal Q2 and A2 doesn't reveal Q1, but it's not really. It's only to a polynomial time machine. Actually, Q2. Uh, sorry, A1 can be the encryption of Q2. So of course it reveals Q2. It contains the encryption. And A2 can be the encryption of Q1, similarly, right? So the only thing encryption promises you is that in the eyes of a polynomial time machine, or in the eye of someone who cannot break the encryption, only in his eyes, Q2 doesn't reveal information about A1. Okay. So let me uh, explain now this. Uh, so actually, what we need is not classical MIPs. That's not good enough for us. Because classical MIPs are only good against cl uh, uh, local strategies. What we need uh, to start is with, a non with an MIP that's secure against non-signaling strategies. And actually, even more than that, we need the MIP to be secure against an adversary that actually signals. But he signals in a way that a polynomial time person cannot cannot see that he signals. And this is what we call computational no signaling. So a strategy that looks, no, looks like it's no signaling, but it can, it can actually signal information theoretically. And we need to be secure against these kind of things. OK, so, okay, so uh, I'll skip through this fast because I don't have much time and because the formalism I think is not that important. But you know, there's a non-signal, I call non-signaling MIP it's just a shortcut for saying MIP that's secure against non-signaling strategies. Uh, so non-signaling strategies just says, right, that answer one is independent of Q2 conditioned on Q1. Loosely speaking, I'll say A1 hides Q2. Hides meaning it doesn't contain any information. That's what non-signaling, and similarly, similarly for A2 hides Q1. What we need is computational non-signaling, or more generally, T non-signaling, which means that A1 hides Q2 or A2 hides Q1 only from a poly T machine. And the reason I'm putting here T, T you should think of poly ideally, but our observation or what we showed, and this is the connection to the non-signaling, we showed if you can come up with an MIP, that is secure against non-signaling strategies, or T non-signaling, for any T. If there exists some T, poly or more than poly, and you can come up with a proof that's secure, even if a cheating prover not only is non-signaling, it's even signaling, but in a way that a T, poly T time adversary cannot detect that it's signaling. If you have such a thing, then you're sound. Then, you ha then this is good. You have your snarg. This is the snarg, that's it. And uh, so the only goal is to construct these 
MIP, one that's secure, ideally against poly non-signaling strategies, and then you're secure against assuming po the FHE is polynomially secure. Okay, so I don't, I'll just say, we constructed it for P exactly as we wanted it. What about NP? We didn't do it for all of NP. We did it for bounded space NP. I don't want to go into the details. Just want to mention it's impossible for all of NP, okay, because uh, we know that in general, non singly MIP is equal to exp. It's not more than exp. So the scaled down version here is uh, going to be in like n to the poly log n. A, or not all of NP. A, so let me summarize and end with a very, I want to summarize to get to my open problem that I think is interesting. So what we showed, the point that I want to uh, want to emphasize, we have, even though we're trying to do a snark that has nothing to do with quantum, we just want to, you know, delegate, verify, delegate classical computations. That's it. We just want non-interactive solutions. The way we got to there is via constructing an MIP that's secure against non signaling strategies. But you're not going to say anything about this? I'm not going to say anything about how I construct these MIP. That's pretty technical. It requires a big talk. Uh, no, I'm not going to say anything about how these are constructed. Uh, but I can say it's actually we use kind of the BFLS and we almost, uh, we ch change it very little and all the hard part in, is in the analysis. Can this be used as a lemma for relations between Q and the star? So, yeah, so the question was, can you use this for quantum computations or a... Uh, one side, or at least for Celtics or something. You can use it, yes. And I'm going to, uh, next slide, I'm going to talk exactly, I think, about what you're saying. Yes, you can, you can, and we'll, we're going to get to that in a second, exactly how. Uh, and then, okay, we constructed, you know, uh, these non-signaling uh, things for P and for some classes of NP, which I don't want to talk about, but then it immediately gives you the songs that you want. Okay, so the, the, all the hard part was actually, you know, the constructing these no signaling things, which I won't talk about. Just one thing about that, I don't know if it's, so the way you construct it, you actually get not two clouds, but some body log clouds or something. Right, good. So that, is that, that's not important at all, you just end up Yeah, right, so good. So what, what uh, Tomas was saying, and he's right, is actually we construct this non-signaling MIP, it's not with two clouds. We have polylog many clouds. So we have here polylog many boxes. But this theorem is true for any number of boxes. You take any, you take MIP with any number of provers and you convert it to a snarg with the same number of boxes. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that you can't hope to get uh, system arguments for all of MP uh, because of the limit on the power of MIP when it has to be secure against non <coughs> rivers. But we know that MIP star, which is where the provers are allowed to share uh, entangled mm -hmm. correlations, is, is more powerful. Yes. Um, so Good. does adding communication, or like adding uh, some kind of joint strategy affect that? OK, that's a very good question. So first, I want to say that you have a great, great question. First, I want to say, uh, so what I said is non-signaling, the approach of going from non-signaling MIP to here will not work for all of NP because non-signaling MIP on its own is not a strong enough model. However, you can reach here via other means. Nobody said that the only way to go is to go through non-signaling to here. Maybe you can go give another snarg. That's possible. But, but there is actually a negative result in, from the quantum, from the crypto literature by Gentry and Wicks from 2011, I believe where they showed that actually coming up with a snarg for all of NP under standard cryptographic assumptions will require new techniques. It's kind of impossible via black box reductions, which is what we're used to working with. So it seemed like considering snarg for all of NP is beyond our current capabilities. But that's with the negative result from the crypto community. So, you know, it doesn't seem, yeah. I don't know, but, but maybe you can get other results, not only for bounded space, via other regimes of, of not necessarily non-signaling. You're right. There, so BQP doesn't, is sort of. Uh, Good, BQP. Let's talk about BQP. So their result doesn't. So all what we showed now, yeah, their result, no. Right, all what we showed now, we talked about, about, uh, about uh, classical computations. Okay, we delegated classical computation. What about quantum computations? Let's delegate, we're here in a quantum workshop, let's delegate quantum computations. 
Now, here's the thing. If anyone succeeds, BQP, if you can come up with a non-signaling MIP for BQP, then we're golden. Why? Well, thanks to Omila, you know, we have uh, FHE for quantum computations. You really just take the two, that's it. You get a snark for comp quantum computations. So if you come up with a non-signaling or computationally non-signaling uh, MIP for quantum computation, then you get a snark automatically. I think that's a very, very good problem. You know, it would be great if we, if, uh, you know, we can get here. Uh, so that's definitely something I would, like, I would like to see, I would like to work on, or you guys, even better, you guys work on. Uh, uh, the, only th the next thing I want to say, which is kind of interesting, is I would like to make these snarks uh, publicly verifiable. Actually, we have a direction of, of doing it. And I think it's interesting, also related a little bit to, to non-signaling. So why, I, we said this is privately verifiable. Why? Because to verify the proof, you need to decrypt. If you need to decrypt, you need, you need the secret key. So only the person who has the secret keys corresponding can decrypt. Okay, so, so you need the secret keys to verify. That's not, why not everybody can verify, only the guy who's holding these secret keys. But maybe you can use another encoding, not semantically secure, you know, the most secure thing. Maybe you can use another encoding here that hides the queries, but still allows public verifiability. And we have, we have such encoding, and it's very interesting to see how, so, but, but what is it now? Non-signaling is not really enough because this encoding doesn't have semantic security. And now the question, kind of, what property do you really need here to get? You know, what property do you need from the MIP, which you need to be more than non-signaling to get publicly verifiable snarks from this? Okay, so let me end the last slide by saying again, I th really think, you know, this is a, you know, beautiful love affair between quantum and crypto, especially seeing kind of the talks today. I think the results that, uh, you know, came up in the last year or two, also before, but really now it seems like a, a as uh, uh, Ryan O'Donnell called it, uh, quantum awesomeness. A, uh, but really I think it's, it's, um, a great time. This is, I'm very happy that you guys organized, you know, especially this day, which seemed to kind of uh, combine these uh, two communities together. And I really hope to, to see more, more uh, communication between us going on moving forward. Okay, thank you. Any questions? This might be a side question, but if, if from Omila's talk, if you remember, so one of the things that we got used to distinguishing in the, in the setting of quantum interactive proofs is the property of verifiability that, that you talked about. In, and then we talk about blindness sometimes. So we go for protocols that have blindness, meaning that the server doesn't learn. Right. So is that something that's, and, and that's usually not, doesn't show up in these things? I always get confused. Is it just because it's irrelevant, because you could just do the whole thing uh, one extra layer of homework. Exactly. So the reason when we talk about verifiability, we usually don't emphasize blindness is because by just FHE everything, like this is immediately blind, right? You don't learn anything because every, oh, the M, right. But I can give you M, X, and T under the hood. I can, everything in the, I can, everything in the encryption. So because we have homomorphic encryption, we can blind everything by just apply FHE and you're, you're gonna be blind. So that's why we kind of separate the two issues. Yeah, we get blindness for free. One more question. Um, could you explain a little bit about uh, what you mean by uh, non-signaling MIP? Are the provers restricted to local strategies, or are they in the honest case? Or are they yes, exactly. Thank you. In the honest case, they're local. They're really local. Like but sure entanglement, for example, in the quantum setting, though, right? You can allow that. I can allow that, yeah. I can allow them, but, but I'm saying in our protocols, in our actual protocols for, for uh, classical computations, the honest people are local, but they, we need it to be secure even if they were quantum and even if they were non-signaling. It seems perhaps that, that if you allow them to have non-local strategies, that that would extend the power, but still everything would go through, is that correct? Or uh, uh, actually, if, if I, I don't, I mean, if, if uh, you're saying it may be if the honest people, if the honest provers could be non-signaling too or could be uh, quantum, they can have more power. That's why I'm saying maybe you can do BQP. Why not? If, you know, we can, if they share entanglement, now they can do more. 
And that's why, you know, yeah, I think that's, that's exactly the question I would like to see, you know. Uh, I think that's a very, that's, yeah. So classically, is there any result known for BPP? Because if you're going to have to do BQP, you're going to have to deal with this randomization. Yeah, but BPP is trivial because the verifier can send the randomness that he, I mean, you can, yeah, you can, yeah, you can just send the randomness ahead of time, say that which randomness you want, and. That could be a lot of randomness. No, because you can use a PRG, oh, yeah, yeah. a pseudo random generator. In crypto, there's all this magic that you can use to make things short, and yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's thank you all again. Thank you. Next up is uh, Tom, uh, who will take